introductory webinar. Uh, my name is Tracy Delaney and I'm the Executive Director of the Public Health Alliance and we're very pleased to have you joining us here at this uh, lunch hour webinar. Uh, before we jump into this action-packed agenda, I'd like to turn it over to Holly for some housekeeping uh, updates. Hi, here's a quick housekeeping update. We are recording today's webinar and we'll post the recording and presentation slides on our website, www.phasocal.org slash water initiative. Please share the link with interested colleagues who are unable to join us today. Audio is heard through your computer speakers and headset or through your telephone. Everyone has joined the webinar in listen only mode, which means that your audio lines are muted. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the, today's presentation. You can do so at any time via the question box. We will address presentation questions during a Q&A session at the end, uh, but you're welcome to enter them at any time. And if you have any technical difficulties, send us a question to the webinar organizers or call GoToWebinar at 855-352-9002. Tracy, back over to you. Great. So can you put me up into a uh, slideshow, Holly? Are you not seeing the slide? The sli I believe the slide's up on the screen now. Um, I don't have it in slideshow mode, but if you can advance the slide over to the Public Health Alliance for a second. Yep, that should be on the screen now. Okay, well, for some reason I'm not seeing it, but I'm just going to go with it here. And I just would like to welcome you to the, the webinar. Um, just an introduction to our organization, the Public Health Alliance, is that we are a collaboration of nine health departments. And together uh, we represent our, our members 60% of the state's uh, residents. We work on chronic disease prevention and upstream policy systems and environmental uh, work. And our vision is that all Southern California communities are healthy, vibrant, and sustainable places to live, work, and play. So you can find out a little bit more about us on our website, which is phasocal.org. And I'd like to welcome uh, members of the Public Health Alliance that have joined us, but also welcome some new folks that maybe have not been working with us in the Public Health Alliance and welcome you to this uh, introductory webinar and hope that we have some future collaborations together. So you've heard a little bit about, about me. I was hoping that you might be able to take a second and take a poll that we have here so we can find out a little bit more about you and who's on the call. So with that, if you're able to just take a second and uh, categorize yourself as best you can here. Um, if you are other uh, governmental, if you could please take a moment and add into the um, chat box what other governmental organization you work with. And if you also select a other non-governmental, if you can take a moment and add that answer into the chat box as well, that'll help us for future calls, making sure that we're, we're hitting the right target here. So the reason why, as you're doing that, the reason why we put together this webinar, the goal of it, is to actually make the case. Why does public health need to be involved in this critical and emerging issues of water health? This is an introductory webinar, Water Crisis and Health 101. Our real goal in this is that it'll spark your interest and that you'd be interested in participating in a series of webinars that we will be launching uh, starting next month and finding ways that, that you actually, within your work, can make positive contributions to water and health issues across our state. So we're excited to bring you a, a great esteemed list of, of presenters. And we're fortunate enough to have um, Dr. Dick Jackson provide some opening remarks to us. Um, those of you, most of you here probably know Dr. Jackson. Um, he is a trailblazer in the field of environmental health impacts and health. He's a professor of environmental health sciences at UCLA. And over his uh, esteemed career, he's had several leadership positions, which include the California Health Officer and uh, of the state. He's also been Director of Environmental Health at the Centers for Disease Control. He is a recipient of the American Public Health Association's most prestigious award, the Sedgwick Memorial Medal. 
and he serves on the board of directors of the American Institute of Architects. It's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Dick Jackson, and he'll be providing some opening remarks for our webinar. Thank you, Dick. Are you here? David? Hi, this is Dick Jackson. Yeah, we hear, we hear and you. It's a, perfect, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with the Public Health Alliance of Southern California. It's such an important organization, both in the state but nationally. It seems odd after the intense rains in Texas, 11 inches and in six hours, to be thinking about drought. But one of the issues about water is uh, it often arrives not the way we want it, not at the time we need it, but boy, do we need it now. Right now, and I, the big point I want to make is dr this drought, this water shortage, is a critical public health issue. We're not in a severe drought. We're not in an extreme drought. The term for it is exceptional drought, but I have to say the word is inadequate because maybe it ought to be renamed epochal. That is, the end of one epoch and the beginning of a new, drier epoch. And throughout uh, geologic history, there have been periods of extreme dryness and much greater wetness. And there are serious uh, meteorologists that think that we are entering a new epoch, a new era. Just in the last, uh, since 1980, the last 30 plus years, the average temperature in California has gone up about two degrees Fahrenheit. So we're looking at climate change at the same time. And nighttime temperatures are going up even more than uh, daytime temperatures, which means that uh, there are impacts both on human health and for agriculture. And you all know as it becomes warmer, the need for water goes up and the amount of moisture that is picked up out of the ground uh, goes up as well. Just to give a sense of how serious this is, 16 months ago, in January of 2014, Governor Brown declared a drought emergency. At that point, the drought index, PDSI it's called, was at negative five, the lowest since records started back in the 1890s. And you all know what's happened since then. El Nino did not come to our rescue. It's barely rained or snowed. So in April of this year, California actually succeeded with a new quote-unquote low water mark with the Sierra uh, snowpack at 5%, that is 5% of the long-term average. The previous lowest reading back in 1950 was 25%. That's how dramatically uh, different this epidemic or this drought is. We all know that civilizations live or die with water, whether it was the Fertile Crescent between the Tigris Euphrates, and we all know that our major cities are built around water, and none of our major cities could have been built without uh, abundant and, and healthy uh, water supplies. Back in 1900, the infant mortality rate in the United States was 185 per 1,000 births, and today it's seven per 1,000 births, the leading causes of death for children back in those days. And that was the big increase in, in both life span overall, but also reduction in children's uh, death rates was the provision of high quality drinking water. They built, built the presence of sanitation along, of course, with better nutrition and the importance in immunization. Um, we th when we think about water, we think about it as something to you know drink, to cook, and to wash with. but we need to think about water not just as it comes into us, but what happens when we're finished with it. And we have had too long a thought of just the upstream sources of our water and not enough about what happens afterwards. Uh, I spent nine years as the director of the National Center for Environmental Health at CDC, and one of the groups in that center was the International Refugee and Disaster Group. And I learned so much from them. They went to the most uh, desperate places you could imagine on the face of the earth. And I came to that, those meetings and learning from these people with a, uh, a sort of a prejudice that the most important thing was clean drinking water. And they said, oh yeah, in the very beginning you have to have clean drinking water, bottled water, treatment, et cetera. But if you're going to have any kind of infrastructure, it's what you it's how you keep the water that's there clean. And so sanitation is actually as critical, in some ways more critical over the long term than is even the provision of clean and immediate drinking water. It makes me think about the city of uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. I was there last month and they explained to me that Charlotte's 
treated sewage is put back into the river upstream from the city. And there are serious people that think the traditional history of putting your wastewater, your effluent, your treated water uh, back into the water supply or river downstream, which is what we've always done throughout history, needs to end. And that we ought to be putting it upstream because it'll make us, if nothing else, much more careful about the quality of what we put into our water. Water is more important than gold in California's history and our agriculture industry, which was um, about 20% of the GDP in the state 30 years ago, it's still a substantial portion, um, is absolutely dependent on it. The, but what's happened over that time is our highest quality soils, particularly around, for example, San Francisco Bay, um, Orange County and elsewhere, have been paved over with housing. And so more and more we're moving to uh, really parched and more arid uh, agricultural lands which require the use of fossil water or uh, you know water that's been underground for thousands of years and sadly I would assert that a great deal of water is being used for crops that uh, really are not essential to health whether it's hay or alfalfa um, or for that matter we're the biggest uh, dairy state and yet for a lot of reasons, dairying in very arid areas probably doesn't make as much sense as well. Agriculture consumes about 80% of our water. Water is wealth, and it's just not, and it's expensive. It's not just the water we put and get in square bottles that are shipped from the island of Fiji or from melting glaciers in Greenland. Um, land without water is almost worthless. Um, it is an underground wealth just like iron ore and precious uh, metals. And getting water to us is costly. And uh, think, I don't know the exact cost of the overall California water project, but it's got to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Just getting water pumped to the city of Los Angeles consumes 18% of all the electricity in the United States. I'm sorry, in the, in the state of California. So these are enormous expenditures. So when you see the word water, think money, think energy, because they are very much the same. And as we uh, go forward, we're going to have to be thinking much more about the infrastructure that delivers and takes away and treats water, but also where is the, where do we get the most benefit for human well-being uh, with the uses of our water? And for that reason, I'm, I'm very lucky to be here with uh, Jay and with Linda, and uh, it's an honor to be with you all. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. This is, this is great. I um, appreciate the opening remarks. So yes, water really is the is worth more than gold. So let's look at this a little bit deeper. I'd like to introduce our, our next speaker, Dr. Linda Rudolph. We're very fortunate to have her. She is the director of, for the Center for Climate Change and Health, and she's a co-convener for the United States Climate and Health Alliance. Previously, Dr. Rudolph served as Deputy Director of the California Department of Public Health Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Public Health, and she uh, has been a health officer and public health director of the city of Berkeley in California. While she was at the California Department of Public Health, Dr. Rudolph chaired the Strategic Growth Council's Health and All Policy Task Force and the California Climate Action Team Public Health Work Group. We're very pleased to, to have such a visionary and expert on climate and health welcome us in this introductory uh, webinar. Linda, I'd like to turn it over to you, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Thank you so much for asking me to uh, participate in this webinar, and uh, I think that the whole issue of water and health is an absolutely critical one. And um, I want to, like Dick did, just sort of step back for just a moment and look at um, all the different things that we need water for. Water really is essential for life, and that's why both the UN and California have declared that there is a human right to water. We use water for a lot, and obviously 
water sustains life. We need it to stay hydrated. We need it to grow food, fiber, and uh, trees, which provide shelter. We use it for sanitation and hygiene. We use it for power. Uh, we use it for transportation. We use it to maintain habitats that provide uh, ecosystems, resources. We use it for cultural and spiritual reasons, for recreation, and to provide places that we want to be. The UN has um, basically identified five different attributes of, of what's required to have water for life. And those are that there be sufficient water per person uh, to ensure that basic needs are met, that water be safe, that it be acceptable so that people actually feel like they can use it, that it be accessible, and that it be affordable. And I found the metrics that the UN uses to be really quite shocking in terms of thinking about um, how lucky we are to have the water systems that we have in the United States. As Dick mentioned, sanitation and safe drinking water really are among the great public health achievements of the 20th century and really were intimately related with the reductions in infectious disease deaths that allowed for the epidemiological transition to the chronic disease problems that we now face that I'll touch on again later. I think it's important to remember that about one out of every six people on the globe today do not have access to a safe and adequate water supply and that that's expected to increase significantly in large part due to climate change but also due to population growth. There are still millions of deaths, mainly among children, from diseases due to unsafe drinking water. And as our population grows and the demand for food production increases, our demands on our water supply are increasing. And climate change is just adding to that water stress and increasing, as Dick said, the need to make sure that we really think about how we're using this very precious resource. If you look at the averages in Africa, it's about five gallons per day per capita. In the US, it's about 100 to 150 gallons per day per capita. But you can see in California this huge range from about uh, 76, just south of San Francisco, all the way up to about 736 gallons per capita per day in Palm Springs. And water use varies a lot according to not just what the local rainfall and temperature is, but also things like the age of the housing stock because new houses have more efficient plumbing, income, where higher income people tend to use more water, population density, water prices, and a whole variety of different kinds of uh, laws and regu regulations and entitlements. How is climate change impacting water in California? Well, obviously we have the drought and that will be the subject of much of uh, Jay's presentation. Um, but we also are gonna have uh, sea level rise with storm surges, higher um, high tides that create flooding. We're having, as Dick mentioned, rising temperatures that lead to increases in evapotranspiration and drying of the soil. But we also have uh, more precipitation falling as rain than as snow. And what that means is that we get reduced spring and summer snow melt, much of which we need to maintain our water supply during our dry months. And we also have an increase in what have now been termed rain bombs, a new term that I just heard in relationship to the flooding that's going on in Houston right now where more precipitation falls in much more condensed time periods, so you get this extreme precipitation events more frequently. So what are the health impacts of these climate change impacts on water? Let's start with the drought. I'm not going to go into this right now. Um, Gonna, Dick already addressed how bad the drought is and how low the snowpack is, and Jay will address this in greater detail. There's a lot of impacts of drought on health, starting with water quality, the availability and affordability of, of water, 
the impacts on food, uh, the increase in stagnant pools of water and increases in improper water storage lead to changes in vector-borne disease, uh, the increases in dryness and in warmth increase the risks of wildfire with, with its attendant risks of both injury and uh, smoke. Uh, dr dust also contributes to increased particulate levels in the air and the warmth and dryness associated with climate change can increase pollen counts. There's recreational risks associated with um, just uh, reduced depth of water bodies that people are used to use for uh, jumping and swimming in. And of course, there's the health impacts associated with unemployment and the economic impacts of drought, which are very significant. About a third of all Central Valley jobs in California are related to, to farming, and it's estimated that uh, tens of thousands of people may be out of work as a result of the, the ongoing drought. So most communities in California are not reliant on a single source of water, but some are. And um, there are quite a few communities in California now and hundreds of families who are facing acute water shortages as a result of the drought. Drought uh, impacts water quality by increasing the concentration of pollutants and contaminants in both ground and surface water. Uh, already in California, there's over 21 million Californians who rely on contaminated groundwater as a source of their drinking water. And as people start to use more recycled water for food, irrigation, and processing, there's a, a risk of increasing exposure to biological contaminants. Drought has big impacts on food production. Thousands of acres are being fallowed in California now. And uh, drought and increasing temperature also create conditions that encourage insect and disease infestation in some crops, reducing crop yield. Lowering crop yields result in rising food prices. And we know that food insecurity is associated with chronic illnesses like diabetes and obesity. And the drought is also affecting the health of livestock as well as the cost of livestock feed. And that's resulted in the culling of herds that can increase meat and dairy prices. And finally, drought's having a big impact on our fisheries. So in California, the Department of Fish and Game is actually um, literally tra physically transporting salmon from uh, one spot on the river to the next because some of the rivers have been so low that the salmon can't make it to their spawning grounds by themselves. So different amounts of food obviously uh, take different amounts of water to grow. Um, and there's been a lot of press lately about how much water it takes to grow one almond, which is over a gallon of water. Dick asked whether or not we're growing the right kinds of crops. And I just want to touch on this because there's been so much press around almonds. Uh, California grows about 90% of all U.S. almonds, uh, and it also grows uh, over 90% of a lot of other fruits and vegetables and nuts in the U.S. But if you really look at what the thirstiest crops are, it's alfalfa, and that translates into... Um, huge amounts of water that are going into uh, dairy and beef projects. So I think that's important to remember. We're all recommending, this is from the 2015 Dietary Guidelines Report of USDA, uh, the draft report, we're all recommending that people eat diets that are richer in vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and nuts, as well as seafoods and legumes. So I think this issue of how we use our water is very, very complicated, and it's not just a question of um, how much water a particular crop uses, but also how it's linked to other critical issues like good nutrition. Drought has big impacts on mental health. Um, it's an extended event, unlike other events. It doesn't have a single moment of impact. Um, and it's particularly stressful in farm families and farm communities. In Australia, there's been a number of suicide 
um, events associated with the drought and farmers. So let's move on and talk about some of the other impacts of climate change on uh, water. Climate change is increasing the water temperature of both coastal and inland water bodies. And this allows naturally occurring pathogens um, and uh, toxic harmful algae to grow more. It expands the seasonal windows of growth for these uh, pathogens and it, and it expands their geographic range. There's also some evidence that warmer temperatures increase mercury contamination in fish populations. We are seeing the impacts of climate change with extreme precipitation and flooding in Texas now. Um, that's because warmer air holds more moisture and as I mentioned, rain is falling in more concentrated episodes. And these flooding events um, create a risk of overwhelming our water infrastructure, our combined sewer treatment systems and our water treatment facilities. Unless you think that California is not at risk of flooding, in 1862 we had what is known as an arc storm or an atmospheric river where uh, we got about 66 inches of rain in Los Angeles. That's a lot. And there was a huge inland sea created in California that was about 300 miles long, 20 miles wide, and 30 feet deep. In the right and bottom pictures here, you see another atmospheric river event in 1938 that completely flooded downtown Anaheim and much of Orange County. When we get these huge um, extreme precipitation events, we see physical injuries and property destruction and displacement. We see increased runoff, including contaminants. We see sewage overflows, and um, all of these uh, raise the risk for waterborne disease outbreaks. Um, we also see um, the mental health effects of acute extreme uh, weather events. And these include um, disruption in medications. And subsequent to droughts, we've seen a lot of uh, problems with mold in houses that aren't adequately um, cleaned and dried following a flooding event. So about a half of all waterborne disease outbreaks are uh, in the US um, have been associated with extreme precipitation events. The worst of these probably was the 1993 cryptosporidium outbreak in Milwaukee that affected about one and a half million people, of whom about 400,000 had very significant symptoms. Flooding and drought also impact our transportation systems, flooding by um, creating impassable roads. Uh, on the left, you see all of the barges stacked up on the Mississippi River in the drought of 2011-2012. Um, and there was a lot of loss of grain crops due to the fact that the crops couldn't get out to where they needed to go, and they just were ruined sitting on these barges in the river. Sea level rise and storm surge also create flooding events um, with the same, same impact as uh, flooding from extreme weather. And sea level rise also increases the intrusion of salt water into our drinking water supplies. And that will be of particular concern in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta area. Dick mentioned the impacts of uh, drought on displacement and migration. Millions of people were displaced by the Dust Bowl in the United States in the 30s. And here, in, here you also see displacement in Syria, where many experts, national security experts, believe that one of the um, initiating factors for the civil war in Syria was a very prolonged and severe drought that caused the internal displacement of millions of people, and that led to strife and conflict over food and water resources in the places that they migrated to. So what's the role of public health in addressing this range of, of problems that are associated with uh, climate change and water? First, 
we really do need to ensure access to adequate supplies of safe and clean drinking water um, and water for sanitation and hygiene and water for healthy food production. I think we can start by educating the public about the relationships between water, climate change, and health. And we can make sure to advocate for water policies and programs that also address health and equity. We need to do everything we can to protect our precious water resources. And that means protecting them from pollution and building our cities in a way that allows for replenishment of our groundwater aquifers. In the remainder of this webinar series, we'll be looking more closely at policies and programs that enhance water sustainability. We need to think about how to increase our monitoring for water-related health risks and outcomes, as we know they're going to become more frequent. And we need to really enhance our public health preparedness for both the uh, immediate impacts of extreme rain and precipitation and also the slower moving impacts of drought. So I hope that you'll all join uh, the Public Health Alliance of Southern California for the remainder of these um, important water webinars. And I thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. And can I borrow a slide that has our, our brochures on it? That looks great. Um, I think that we're really seeing this up where you can see why this is important for us to be involved. As the series goes on, I just want to assure you that we'll be looking at practical, constructive strategies you can do that will um, actually help spread these issues across the as well. So now it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Jay Farrett, and um, he is professor of Earth Sciences, uh, I'm sorry, of Earth System Science and Soil and Environmental Engineering at UC Irvine, and he's a senior water scientist with NISA, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and at the California Institute of Technology. He was appointed by California Governor Jerry Brown to the Santa Ana Regional Water Quality Control Board. And he was also the meeting director of the UC Center for Hydrologic Modeling at UC Irvine. Uh, he's a prominent thought leader and speaker on California's water crisis. Uh, we actually also uh, were able to send out some of the materials that he had written uh, many times to our leader of council. And it's a great honor to introduce Jay and to turn it over to you. And Jay, I'm not hearing you yet. Okay, so let's see. Um, okay, yeah, I'm unmuted, so you can you can hear me. Can can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, very good. And can you see my screen? Double yes. Okay, so let me. Um, First of all, thank everyone for for having me, and it's a, it's a pleasure to present in this venue. And uh, Dick and Linda, I think, did an excellent job um, explaining the link between water and public health and, and climate change. So I can really focus on some of the research that that we've been doing. Uh, unfortunately, it does not paint um, any rosier picture than what we've heard so far. This image. Uh, is one that we put together from a, a satellite that we use called GRACE, which stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, and I'll explain that in a minute. But, you know, you kind of get the picture by seeing the, the sort of traffic signal colors, the green, yellow, red, that things have been uh, progressing on a, a very downward trajectory in terms of water availability and particularly groundwater availability um, in, in California, and it has been going on. Really, it, it hasn't just been, as I'll show you in a few slides, it has not just been the last three or four years. It's really been going on for some time, and a lot of it has to do with the 
depletion of our groundwater uh, resources. Uh, so again, thank you for uh, for having me, and um, I'm trying to advance my slides, but I'm being unsuccessful. There we go. Okay, so this is something that I experienced last night when I was out uh, in Hollywood, and uh, we call that drought. That's drought humor. Um, moving, moving right along. So. I gave a presentation in San Francisco. We have a big society meeting in uh, San Francisco in December, and I put together the 2014 drought timeline. And it was so compelling that I've kept going almost up to the present. So let, let me just highlight a few things and then move on to some other uh, some other slides. So you know, over a year ago now, the governor declared a drought emergency, um, and then our allocations of surface water, uh, the water, the snow melt from the Sierras. Uh, and the allocations from the north to the south uh, were cut by 100%. Uh, so this were back in 2014. The president came out on uh, Valentine's Day. Um, the other big water project that moves water from the north, uh, north to the south cut allocations, cut those deliveries by 100%, which, by the way, means that we just have increasingly more reliance on groundwater at this point in time. Uh, California is probably drawing about 75% of its statewide water supply from groundwater. Uh, Lake Mead uh, on July 14th last year dropped to a record low, but you know it's continued to drop and it's approaching new record lows. Um, and so that's been in the news lately. UC Davis estimated the damage uh, financial impacts just for the 2014 uh, uh, financial impacts at uh, 2.2 billion and a loss of 17,000 jobs. Um, and midsummer, this is right about when we, we moved out, my family moved from Irvine to Pasadena last summer, uh, the State Water Resources Control Board began uh, approving fines for, for wasting water. And you know we all probably still see people out there uh, washing down the concrete. Uh, governor in August signed a $7.5 billion drought release package, the first of, of more than one. A big uh, step forward for California water management was the signing of the historic groundwater management uh, legislation. Um, many people probably don't even realize that groundwater in California is essentially unregulated and unmanaged. If you have a well, you can pump as much as you want, even if that means you are drawing down uh, the water levels underneath your neighbor's property and, and perhaps forcing um, uh, his or her well to to go dry so that's historic legislation but it will take a couple of decades to, to actually implement there's another seven and a half billion dollars approved um, so clearly this is a, a a big deal and then we started looking at our allocations at the end of 2014 our surface water allocations how much water we were going to release from our streams from the sacramento and san joaquin rivers which are fed by snow melting sierras how much we would be shipping um, down to Southern California and to the Central Valley, and the first allocations were were set at a 90% a reduction. Uh, you know, we've had the driest winter, not just the driest January, and the hottest winter on record. Something I just figured out myself over the past couple of days by sort of piecing the temperature records and the and the precipitation records together. That's what really set. Uh, this drought apart from other droughts. You know, we talk about the 1977 drought. It might have been a little bit drier, but it certainly wasn't as hot, and we certainly didn't have the, uh, the population that we do now. We hear a lot about mega drought. There was a very scary study that came out in February. Mega drought uh, simply means a drought that lasts for more than two decades. And there was a study that came out uh, in part from NASA, in part from Cornell, um, maybe Columbia University, that looked at the probability of a mega drought two decades or long occurring in the latter half of the 21st century, so after 2050, but one that was of unprecedented uh, severity and the likelihood of having a mega drought after 2050 uh, of unprecedented severity uh, was 80%. And that is certainly something that we are not prepared for, not from a water management perspective and probably not from a public health uh, perspective. Um, so continuing on with the sad saga of our uh, transfer of surface water, uh, snow melt and river water from the north to the south, uh, a, the other big project, the Central Valley Project, cut its allocation by 100%. 
uh, State Water Project actually raised its allocation to 20%. So we've got 80% reduction in one big project and 100% reduction in the other big in the other big project. Finally, the State Water Resources Control Board. It's kind of a joke when this happened. And you may remember it in the news. Their big response um, was to this is before the mandatory restrictions. Big response was to uh, make it illegal to just give people water in restaurants. And uh, also, they suggested that to save water, we could um, we could tell our hotels not to wash our towels. So that that was kind of a joke when that came out. Um, then the governor approved yet another billion dollar drought relief package. So we're up to about 15, 16 billion. Um, then uh, I think things really hit the fan, so to speak, when uh, the April 1st snow readings came out. Uh, we recognized that the snowpack was at an all-time low, that the winter was the driest winter on record. It was the hottest winter on record. We had no snow in the mountains. We had very little water in our reservoirs. And our groundwater was being depleted at a record clip, all at all-time lows. Finally, the governor decided to move forward with the 25% uh, uh, water reductions. Um, and those have finally been... Uh, so the governor announced that they would happen, and then I think that the State Water Resources Control Board actually approved them. So, you know, it's kind of hard to wonder how low we can go, but apparently we're going lower and lower, and so we have to ask the question, what's next? And so uh, if anyone has seen um, uh, Mad Max, you might recognize this as the uh, Charlize Theron uh, moment when she goes back to her, just only a mild spoiler alert, goes back to her, her homeland and finds that it's been degraded. It's no longer lush and green, but it's, but it's a desert. So uh, anyway, we, have, we certainly have issues. Um, I want to share with you some of the research, some of the observations we make from satellites that are a little bit more holistic um, and then, then, what is, that what we're, then what we're able to do on the ground. Um, and I think a little bit more compelling. So this is the NASA GRACE satellite mission. Uh, the satellites themselves are not very big, um, as you can see from the, the inset picture. Uh, it was launched in 2002. It's still operating. It will have a uh, 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 follow-on mission. It will launch in 2017, so we'll be continuing these measurements for at least another decade, hopefully. Uh, GRACE functions like a scale in the sky in that uh, those satellites actually respond to whether or not they're so they're not taking pictures they're not optical satellites they're just responding to the amount of mass or mass change on the ground so that when there's more water on the ground say because of the Texas floods when the satellites fly over Texas they're actually pulled down because there's more water mass on the ground there's a greater gravitational tug in that region pulls the, the satellites down just a millimeter or so um, and we can measure that, it was crazy, but we can measure it extremely accurately. Likewise, when the satellites fly over the western U.S. or fly over the Central Valley or the Sierras, and there's less water on the ground because of drought, the there's less of a gravitational tug, and the satellites float a little bit higher. So they're the scale. They float a little bit higher uh, in, the, uh, uh, in their orbit, and we can measure those, those ups and downs in the positions of the satellites very, very accurately. So the position of the scale, we measure it, and we map it out, and from that we're able to see how water storage is changing all over the world on a monthly on a monthly basis. Um, here is one of the charts for California, uh, is specifically the Sacramento and the San Joaquin River basins, shown in the upper right with the red outline, and that includes the Central Valley, of course, the big ag region. Um, and so what we're looking at are the the monthly ups and downs of the total amount of water storage in those river basins. It's really most of the water in California. And, uh, you know, since we've got a big health group on the, on the phone, uh, think of these as uh, you're, for the first time, monitoring your own personal weight, and you're checking it every month, and you are watching the ups and downs in a way that you, you know, have never been able to do before. Now, keep in mind something. It doesn't really tell us um, uh, the absolute amount of water, just you know that we've gained five pounds or lost five pounds. So we've got the wet season and the dry season. Um, it also doesn't tell us specifically, without more research, this is the total amount of water. If we want to know how much of this is snow or groundwater, we have to do some research, and I'll, I'll explain that in, um, in, in one of the next slides. But some of the key points here are, 
you know, especially when we look towards the right side of the slide, we're seeing the drought, right? The, the decline there at the end after 2011. Um, and in the last four years, California has lost 8 trillion gallons of water per year. About two thirds of that is coming from groundwater depletion. Another thing to notice here is that this winter peak, this is our wet season, this is winter 2013, 2014, did not even rise to the level of the previous dry season. So our wet seasons are not rising to the level of our dry season. When we get our new data, if you can see my arrow hovering around, our winter peak will be right about here. So we are literally falling off the chart. Um, we can see spatially sort of a drought map from the GRACE, from the GRACE satellite that complements the one that I showed in my intro slide. The other thing I want to point out is this issue of the time scales of the drought. We talk about this being a four-year drought, but when we look at this more holistic chart that I'm showing you that looks at all of the water storage changes, um, we could argue that we've been losing water since 2006 and really the whole time period that we have been uh, using this particular satellite. And a lot of this, it turns out, is coming from groundwater. So we have our snow, you know, our rainy season that is stronger or weaker depending on climate oscillations and things like El Nino and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, whether or not we get enough atmospheric river events. But the one thing that we do steadily is deplete the groundwater. And so when you add the two together, you have this long-term um, depletion signal. So groundwater, you know, most of the water that we think about in the world, we tend to think a lot more about surface water we see Lake Mead, we see Lake Powell, uh, we see the reservoirs, we see the snowpack, and even our, a lot of our discussion today has focused on surface water. But, but again, right now, there is really not much surface water available because we had no snow and because we had no rain and the driest winter on record. And so we are right now in California deriving about 75% uh, of our uh, statewide water supply comes from groundwater, which is the water that is in these soil layers or rock units called aquifers that are beneath the ground. Of course, we have to we have to pump it up. The problem there, or problems plural, are uh, it is essentially unregulated right now. We have the new groundwater legislation, but it will take some time, uh, maybe as much as 25 to 30 years before it is effective, and we are really managing our groundwater. The other problem is. Uh, we actually don't really know how much groundwater we have in part because we have never done the exploration that we have needed to do. And it just hasn't been necessary because population hasn't been great, as great as it is today. Agriculture hasn't been as great in scope as it is today. Um, we didn't have the understanding of climate change, um, you know, a de even a decade ago that we, that we do today. So this is something that I have really been advocating for. So the importance of groundwater it is really most of the of the fresh water. 96% uh, of the fresh water globally uh, is the major source of water for over 2 billion people, uh, supplies almost half of the water for irrigation, uh, over half of the drinking water in the United States, and over half of the water for irrigation in the United States. It is, as we are experiencing here in California and around the world, it is the strategic reserve in times of drought. It is our big emergency bank account and you know we are not doing a good job managing it um, here in California and really around the world so so that's kind of frightening with huge implications for for human health so uh, in many parts of the world the, the withdrawals actually go unmonitored in many parts of the US uh, uh, so that lack of management is becoming uh, apparent and it is uh, posing a considerable threat to our water security and as is the topic of our discussion today, our health and human security. Uh, so the Central Valley, I want to show you some examples from the Central Valley. Um, as we know, as the group on the phone knows and heard about in the previous talks, it is one of the most productive agricultural regions in the world. We just heard about the almonds and the pistachios and you know, number one uh, dairy uh, producing region, but it also requires a lot of water, uh, a sixth of all the irrigated land, uh, a fifth of the groundwater demand, uh, in fact, is the second most pumped aquifer in the United States after the High Plains or the Ogallala Aquifer in the central part of um, of the United States. And you know, groundwater depletion and subsidence, the actual sinking of the ground, has been going on for some time. This is a famous picture of a U.S. Geological Survey 
scientist, Joe Poland, um, in 1977, standing next to a telephone pole, showing how much the ground has sunk, has subsided since 1925, almost a foot per year. That's because the ground, just like letting air out of a, a bicycle tire, the ground deflates in some places, not everywhere. It depends on the geology of the, the minerals of the, of the, of the rocks. Um, of the aquifers, but in some places the ground can subside as much as a as a foot per year, and that's that's happening mostly in the southern part uh, the southern part of the Central Valley. This slide now I mentioned that we can take the grace data that chart that I showed you uh, with a very serious decline towards the end and isolate the part that's just the groundwater, and that's what I've shown here. This is our estimate of groundwater storage changes across the entire Central Valley, shown in the black line. Okay, starting uh, so every month going back to 2003, almost up to the present. The colors in the background, the two bars, every year there is a bar there that shows how much surface water is available through the project, through the through the uh, Central Valley project, and through the uh, state water project shown in uh, shown in orange in the fuchsia color um, in this in this diagram, and. Uh, those allocations are done on a percentage basis. So 2006, you can see, was a great year, 100% allocation. And you know, 2014, 2015 are 0% and 10%, 0% and 20% allocation. So there's a very simple message here. As surface water becomes more available through uh, because of because it's a wet a wet year versus a dry year, so surface water becomes more available. Then, uh, as we see in the red and the blue bars. Then the groundwater recovers. That's what we see, right, in the with the black line. And as surface water becomes less available, say during the drought of 2006 through 2010, groundwater takes a big hit. We have to use more groundwater because there is no surface water available, right? So this relationship is pretty much one to one. As the climate gets a little bit wetter and we see more surface water availability, groundwater recovers. And here we are now. So here we are in the current drought. Groundwater is reaching record lows. And again, when we get our data updates, we will be sort of right off the charts here, if not even see a little acceleration in the depletion rate. So this is very, very frightening stuff that has huge implications. And the sad point is, you know, this is not new information. This has been going on uh, for decades. This is a chart that looks back now to 1962 and combines data from the U.S. Geological Survey in red with the GRACE data the NASA GRACE data that I just showed you in the green, um, looking back every year, um, and the colors in the background. So we're looking at cumulative groundwater depletion in the Central Valley. Um, and the colors in the background represent, again, whether it's a wet period or a dry period. Very wet periods are shown in dark blue, and um, the drought periods are shown in tan, and sort of intermediate periods are shown in the lighter colors. And the message here is very much like the last figure. We get a little bit of recovery in a wet period and then a big decline of groundwater during a drought. A little recovery and a big decline. A little recovery and you know, basically a big decline. So we are on this uh, very much one-way trajectory towards the bottom of the Central Valley, and we need to arrest that. Um, just a couple of other slides on some of the work that we do at JPL. We can also monitor the subsidence of the ground. Um, the sinking of the ground when we do the uh, uh, excessive pumping. And so this is a slide that compares uh, pre-drought, so 2007 through 2011, um, to, uh, on the lower right, what happened just last spring, this time last year, spring and fall. Um, and because of the much greater pumping rates, we see much greater rates of subsidence or sinking of the ground as much as a foot per day or more, 12 to 14, 14 to 16 inches in some places, some places even greater. So that's uh, uh, pretty scary stuff. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'll skip over this particular slide. Um, and, you know, I just want to put this in a regional uh, and national perspective. The situation does not get any better when we look at the Colorado River Basin. The behavior that we see here in California with surface water and groundwater basically the same thing that we see in the Colorado River Basin, except nobody really talks about it, and no one talks about sharing the groundwater. If we look in this lower right side, what we're looking at is data from our GRACE satellite, but we've been able to separate out how much, uh, what's happening 
with the levels of water in Lake Powell and Lake Mead, the biggest reservoirs in the United States. That's shown in red. Okay, so we see the decline over the past few years. But that decline is nothing compared to our estimate of the groundwater storage changes in the Colorado River Basin. And so while we're very, very focused on uh, the disappearance of the surface water, right, in Lake Mead, the big bathtub ring, you know, we're not paying attention to the groundwater, and it is disappearing at a rate of about six or seven to one compared to the rate of disappearance of the water in the reservoirs. Uh, let me just go back here. Uh, this is a map that's looking now across the whole United States. Um, we're looking at the trends in water availability from the NASA GRACE uh, satellite mission. The blue regions are gaining water and the reds are losing water. The upper half, so we see quite a very stratified United States, that the upper half is for the most part getting wetter and we're actually having a lot of flooding in the upper Missouri over the past few years, uh, upper Missouri River Basin. And then we see the lower half of the United States drying out with the big depletion signals in the Central Valley and in the, the southern part of the High Plains Aquifer, which is our big food producing region. My guess is now because of the flooding, this signal will disappear, but this will stay because it's related more to groundwater depletion and not flooding. So we have a global crisis that is partly um, climate change driven, as we've heard about, partly human driven because uh, we have a big population that uses more water than is generally available to us. Uh, I'll skip over these pictures, just some uh, events that we organize on the UC Irvine campus where our students uh, on campus pledged uh, and put together a pledge tree about how they would save their 20%. Uh, this was last year when the governor was only asking us to cut back voluntarily 20%. Um, just to wrap it up, I think that you know, your, the science community, the water science community, and the healthcare community could partner together to really try to uh, raise awareness of critical water issues, but they really have to be raised to the level of everyday understanding. I think that many of the things that our previous speakers, uh, Dick and Linda spoke about, are probably poorly understood by the, by the general public. So we do need to work together. Um, and finally, in a, a shameless uh, plug, um, uh, there will be a rerun of our 60 Minutes episode that uh, coincidentally is on the Sunday. But I thought that this group, because I didn't talk much about water quality, might enjoy this uh, TEDx uh, presentation that's on YouTube. If you just go to my webpage, it's just my name, you can find it. And if you've never seen Last Call at the Oasis, uh, it covers California and global water quantity and quality. Excellent uh, documentary put out by Participant Media. It came out in 2012 and did very poorly uh, commercially, but it's actually an excellent, um, an excellent movie and highly, highly, highly recommended. And that is where I will stop. and frightening. <laughs> hey, thank you very much. This has been a, a fascinating and frightening presentation. I think that um, I would like to thank all of our speakers, um, Dick Jackson, Linda Ruff, and Jay, for these wonderful framing uh, discussions for us. I think one of the things that really struck me is just that this issue is, is escalating and it's happening in real time. Uh, in, a, in a matter of months, months, if not day to day. I think that was really uh, driven home by presentations we had. Um, a couple of months ago, my leadership council challenged uh, us to be able to make the case. Why is this something that we need to be working on? And then to also to how can we constructively integrate this within our, our daily operations? So I think that uh, our speakers did a, a fantastic job explaining this, why this is important and that we need to be uh, working on this very diligently. Uh, this reminds me of kind of where we were maybe 10 years ago, uh, in a, working with new sectors like transportation and, and food systems. So many of us can recognize that this is important, Jay, but we don't necessarily have uh, the expertise and that's part of what we need to work on um, so that we can become uh, better at working with, with your sector and some of the other sectors as well.
so thank you again to our speak, uh, speaking of shameless plugs. I'd like to also introduce uh, and invite any participants, and, and um, if you're willing to help us kind of spread the, the news here. Uh, what we've done is we've curated now a series of webinars uh, based on different kinds of uh, target audiences. And we'll be doing this throughout the summer. We've got a six pack each of these three tracks that we're going to be offering. The first one is around is geared uh, specifically to the water crisis for public health leaders, looking at high level operational issues that we can be doing. Uh, the second one is actually I see Angelo Lomo is so joining us. He'll be launching in June the uh, water drought and environmental uh, health webinar, which is going to be looking at practical applications for mitigating public health impacts. And the, the final track that we're looking at is around food nutrition, which is about climate and the food we eat, and looking at how we can integrate that. We're um, reaching out to NEOP directors, um, those that are working in, in the field of nutrition and food systems, uh, food policy as well. So there's more information on our uh, on our web there. You sign up uh, either for the series or you can pick and choose uh, various topic areas within each of the series or, or both. We welcome you to do that. We've got a group lineup of, of other speakers. And finally, if you have any questions, hopefully we can get the next slide or I'm not seeing. Um, please contact Kate Amon, who is here on our staff and is working um, for all, organizing all of these webinars and, and setting these up. So that's her contact information there. And we just thank you for joining us on this call, and we hope that you'll join us in the future and in other uh, colleagues that you think might be interested in this as well. But again, thank you very much, and, and thank you particularly to our speakers for uh, highlighting this, giving us a high bar that we need to work on. Thank you.